Tierra, mas eu não vou mudar de Deus. Jersey Jack, I'm not going to steal your 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 time. I don't want to get in trouble. All right, we're going to I'll tell you about myself real quickly. Um I started in the coin operated game business in 1980. Uh I was uh I was rec recruited by a uh a headhunter. I was programming at the time and uh the first uh the first interview I did was actually on the phone and it wasn't it wasn't with uh with Bally where I ended up starting or with Dave Nutting. Uh it was with another company. I won't mention who they were. And I talked to somebody on the phone and he's interviewing me and I said, you know, I'm I'm kind of a creative guy. And he said, We don't want anybody creative. We need somebody to program. Um I didn't get that job. Thank goodness. Um my first pinball machine was because Larry DeMar was kind enough to find me and say, let's build a, this crazy idea you've got, and I wouldn't be standing here in front of you if it weren't for Larry. And that became Bonsai Run. Um, And I'll never forget, I went to, when I first got to Williams, like the, the first two weeks or something, I, I went to lunch with Ken Fidesna and with Steve and Larry. And, and, and Steve asked me, he said, what makes you think you're good enough to do this? You did? You did. That's so unlike him. It's a good story. <laughs> so it's a true story. And Larry looks at Steve and goes, Steve? Um, Anyway, I ended up uh, going to work at Williams, um, ended up doing uh, a few of their nice games. Um, I got to work with these people who are sitting here, and uh, the rest is history. Um, you all, have, you all know, have, know a lot of these games. I'm not going to bore you to death with them. We're going to get into the history of what these people did and what it meant for the industry on a big picture. So... Go ahead, we're going to start in 1977, 75 to 1989. Pinball was this monster creation in the 1970s after the first solid state game. It took the, it took the, 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 the operating community by storm. Hi, Jim Patla, it's nice to see you. Um, and so what I'm going to do is go ahead and go ahead and do the the thing. Okay, here's a game designed by Jim Patla. Uh, it's called Flickr, and this was the first uh, out of the run of Flickr. Uh, there was there was one of them that was put together and was a solid state pinball. Was there more than one, Jim? Two. And they were put together by Dave Nutting, right? Because Dave had the 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 the, the patent, um, and the reason I'm showing you this game is because this game opened the gates to every pinball machine that existed before this game suddenly became old. They were obsolete. They that you know you couldn't do what you could do with a microcontroller in a pinball machine. Um, and pinball had been doing pretty well, but in 1976, 77, 78, 79, the floodgates opened and, uh, go ahead, and here's Captain F. Um, we're starting to see games that uh, that became these monster selling commodities. Eight ball held the modern record for the number of games sold until Adam's family beat it almost 14 years later. But um, playing eight ball as a player was instrumental in me getting into the business a year later. Right. 
So here we are, it's 1977, the pinball world is going crazy. This game sold 20,230 games, okay? And you couldn't go anywhere in a bar or a tavern or a convenience store and there wasn't a pinball machine there. Okay, it was unbelievable. And there's one other thing I wanna point out during this time. The infrastructure it takes to sell and manufacture those numbers is staggering, okay? To build what they were talking about a few minutes ago, 160 a day, 200 a day. Imagine the amount of material it takes to run through a factory and the people it takes to build them, to produce them and get them out in the world, okay? And the reason I'm, I'm pointing that out is now you've got companies that are becoming these, you know, they're this big, they're this big, they're this big, okay, in order to do this. Go ahead and, and hit it. And here's, here comes Steve. And Steve is part of this. It's Williams 1980. Firepower sold 19,000, how many? I thought it was around 19,000. It was a lot. Um, it was Steve in 1980. Um, it had, Eugene did the software and sound. Um, and here we are, it's 1980, and pinball is, is the undisputed king of the world. And along comes video games. Okay, along comes video games. And overnight, the number of pinball machines you could sell to anyone went from that many to, in 1983, almost zero. Okay? So you've got these companies that were used to building pinball they had the infrastructure to build all this stuff and suddenly they're building video games and they're not selling any pinball machines. And here's Black Knight, same thing. This is Steve, Williams 1980, Larry DeMar Software, Steve Ritchie Playfield. So why don't you take a minute and talk about what it was like because you already started to talk a little bit about about designing and building Black Knight in 1980 and what it was like building it. Right now. Yeah, right now. Okay. <laughs> right now. Um, it was pretty crazy because uh, I think I, I wanted to raise the cabinet side so I could fit more into the game. I mean, before that, you know, well, number one, there weren't any ball hangups. <laughs> the glass was that far above the play field on every game. And so when I brought the cabinet sides up, I, I made room for a, a second level. And uh, when Larry and I worked together, I, I don't really remember when you actually got on the project. Or like when you, did I have a white wood when you, when you um, started? Yeah. 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 No, um, and, and Roger just mentioned the first thing I worked on at Williams was um, what became Barracora, and it was called Las Vegas at the time, and I met Roger and Steve to work with uh, with their design, and that got put aside because bl the Black Knight train was coming through. Yeah. And if Steve Ritchie was the leader of a project, everybody had better step aside Okay, as it gobbles And if up, you have to work with Larry, you better step aside. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I remember is one long argument. No, it wasn't like that. There were there were a few. It happens on every game. It just does. You, you work with people. People are going to have different ideas, people with strong ideas or, uh, you know, just, you know, something that's well thought out and, you know, and, and possibly could be great. You know, that's what we were always looking for. And so, you know, we we had some battles. Plus, we're both Aquarians, and it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, not. No, he's he is my friend today because we decided, after high speed, not to work any, any more games together. <laughs> <laughs> 
but but each of the games. Hey, wait, wait! I want to say this. I I I remember that with love. That's what I remember, Larry. I, I do too. And each of the games okay. uh, stands as a testament yeah. to um, the power of creative, strong-willed people working <laughs> towards the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what's really interesting about this game, and I had been at Williams literally a week when Steve Ritchie is saying he's going to do a two-level pinball machine, and I'm like, oh, I got to be part of this. Um, and the game, the game came out great. It was really successful. People love it. Collectors love it. And um, the biggest innovation in Black Knight is what Steve just said: is by lifting up the glass to put stuff above playfield level because this did not become the norm um and xenon which came out right around the same time it put a little ramp and a tube in the air and and really we have evolved off of that model but the key was was getting up off the playfield one other interesting point is um a guy who shall remain unnamed who i actually brought from Atari, let him live at my house, and he stunk up my couch. <laughs> <laughs> His initials were CF. Anyway, he uh, he was working upstairs with uh, in the same area that I was at Williams, and um, it was just like open. You could walk by somebody's table. And uh, one day, he just up and split. He was gone. And then we found out a week later he went to Bally. And he took everything that I had on Black Knight on the left side. I didn't have the right side done, everything, yep. and made Flash Gordon. Yep. Yeah, I, and Mike I was Stroll was so pissed he wanted to kick his ass on the floor. I, I, was, I got to see I'll, – I'll tell the story in a minute because I want to go back a game. I want to go back with Greg inside. Uh, uh, can you go back? Yeah, go back. Go back another one. Okay, go and we've got eight ball and then we've got Captain F right back there. Okay, go back to Captain F. I want you to talk a little bit because in the notes that you sent me, you talked about the the silk screening and the art and what goes on here. And in this era, I want you to get an idea of the amount of work it took artistically and with the people who produced these, you know, with with uh, with Greg. So yeah. Um, when I got to Bally, the uh, we're still doing silkscreen uh, playfield, silkscreen back glasses, and these were all, uh, you'd start with an ink, a tight ink, and then you would uh, have to cut ruby lift. Uh, I don't even want to get into describing what that really is if you don't know what it is because it's hard to describe, but you would have to hand cut each color um, and and layer those colors uh, over, you know, probably some t- sometimes up to 15 colors on a back glass or a play field. And, um, and it wasn't until Paul Ferris introduced the idea of four color silk screen uh, on back glasses that it changed everything for us illustrators because now we could do a painting and have the painting reproduced and, and transferred to the glass uh, through four color process printing. Um, so to me, uh, my start at Bally was because they had already um, gone in that direction with Lost World. And um, we, uh, it saved, it, sa- it didn't save us time per se, but it definitely gave the back glasses a different uh, look, a, a more depth, more like an album cover. And that's kind of what we all aspired to be was album cover artists. You know, John Yossi was an album cover artist at one time. So, um, you know, that was an important step uh, for for Bally to take in creating a different look for back glasses. What were, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What were we doing at Williams? Were we doing four color or were we doing individual screens? You were That's doing in, individual screens, yeah. 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 yeah, Connie Mitchell. I mean, it was kind of rocky in the beginning. Like, I remember high speed was a four color, and it's like there were greenish ones and red. Oh, yeah. There was, it, you know? it wasn't perfection uh, by any stretch. I would walk down the line and see different back glasses, the same back glass, but 
you know, coming in from the vendor and it would start, you know, all the correct color and then it would go green and then it would go blue, you know. So it wasn't a perfect science, but it, it definitely allowed the illustrators to do something that they weren't allowed to do previous to that. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna once again stop. We're, we're gonna, we've got to move on because we're running out of time. But, but I want to tell you a little, a little story about how much the companies, Valley and Williams, competed against each other. I was working for an R&D arm that was part of Valley, and the, the pinball world, had collapsed in 1982 pretty much. And both companies were desperately trying anything they could to try and get back into the pinball business. And I was invited to a top secret thing internally at Bally where they had stolen a Williams prototype off a dock. And they had it at Bally and they were trying to figure out what they were going to do with it in response to what Williams might be working on. That's a thing. Okay, they really did that. Um, all right, we're going to go up to... Uh, we're going to go up to space, uh, space Shuttle. And the reason I've got Space Shuttle here is because I'm going to tell you a story about how close this company, the companies almost came to there being no pinball at all. Okay, we showed you Flickr. And we showed you, uh, I showed you that there was a court, there was a, a patent involved with the solid state version of the games. That patent was owned by it was actually owned by Dave Nutting, but Bally had purchased him and sort of bought him and so that they could they could use it. Bally sued Williams for doing solid state pinball with Flickr. Or yeah, Flickr. And there was a court case where they ended up in court, okay, and if if Williams had lost that court case they could have been forced to stop production of all pinball machines that were solid state, okay? Now remember, the world's collapsing by this time, and these guys are fighting with each other in court in, you know, so that they can you know, be king of the hill. A, a, a quick tale from that court case. Um, there was, they brought in the prototype from Dave Nutting that was evidence showing That's how it was put together. Yeah. What? Yeah, that's the story I was going to tell. Okay, then go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah they brought they brought the the only reason that that didn't that one of the only reasons that 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 they were unable to prevail, okay, was because Dave Nutting had taken the one or two prototypes and it didn't work, and they gave it to one of the people internally and said, make this work again. And so he soldered new chips into the board to make it work. And during the court case, they opened up the back of the game and told the judge, this can't possibly have been available in 1987 because the dates on the chips on this board are from 1983. Okay, and they said case dismissed in so many words, okay? Um, so the world now is down to essentially one pinball company because Bally's in extreme stress. Williams is in pretty extreme stress. Video is on the verge of collapse on its own because um, it's been overproduced and the games weren't that good at the end. And along comes Space Shuttle. And I've been told this story by three different people. Please, Williams people, tell me what would have happened if you hadn't sold this. Uh, Ken Fidesna in the back row would be the best to, to give it. But the story was that we needed some number of orders for the game at the AMOA show. Ken's nodding, thank you that um, exceeded what we had produced on the last several games. Firepower 2 came just before this, which was a, a step up from the, the deadness pinball was in it. It probably sold maybe 20, 2,500 or so. Um, and, it was, and, it, and, and we had heard that if we can't get 4,000 or 5,000 orders for the new game at the show, 
that they were shutting pinball down. Um, the slide here says uh, Joe Cam and Co. And Joe dreamt up this whole project, but Barry Barry Ausler designed the play field for Space Shuttle, not Joe. <laughs> yeah, what, what Joe actually did was uh, uh, get the rights to be able to feature the space shuttle. Right, right. And actually, um, for Williams, that was really our first foray, foray into licensing, which uh, yep. doesn't help Pinball at all anymore. But so, sure. so in the big picture, high speed sort of makes it possible for these guys to continue to make pinball machine, or I'm sorry, uh, space shuttle to keep building them. And then in a few years, along comes this game. And go ahead and give the next, oh, I don't have that. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this because it's important. Because every game that you see out there on the floor all the way to 2024 has some of this in it. And remember, this is 40 years ago almost, 40 years ago. This was the first pinball to play a complete song. It was the first Williams pin game to use alphanumeric displays. It was the first use of automatic percentaging in a solid state game so that the replays would reflex up and down on location up till that time they had to be fixed, okay? Um, it was the first jackpot available only during multi-ball. It was the first use of broken switch compensation programming. It's all feeling, it's all feeling. Right? And it was the first solid state game with an operator report that came out of it. These games were now starting to evolve into what you expect to see in a modern game. And, um, you know, for, for that, these guys need to be congratulated. All right, we're gonna we're gonna show this because this this is what started Data East Pinball. This was Laser War. Um, this was 1987, um, and uh, I put this in here because uh, Larry, Larry and I have a pretty funny story that goes with it, and I'm not gonna spend time to talk about it right now. But but it had to do with the first show they took it to. Uh, they were getting ready to put it on the show floor, and it didn't work because it kept crashing. And they were literally getting ready to screw posts down in front of shots so that you couldn't play multi-ball to show the game. It just shows what you go, the extremes you go to to make a show and you know do what you have to do with the game. Go ahead. Um, 1989 to 1999, the last golden age of monster sales when we hit 20,000. Hit it. Here's our shaker. Okay. The reason that this is up here is. Uh, Chris Graner music, um, John Hay was involved in it. And um, this is uh, the only reason this is in there, not to make me feel good. Every game now that has a shaker motor in it is because of that, yep. okay? And, and, and dur during the development of Earthshaker, um, Pat took a lot of abuse from the engineering team because you know, we already have a, a, a product that's hard to maintain competing against video games, which really have no maintenance. Um, and you put in this thing that rattles the game around and the, and it was, it was internally, the game was called screw loosener. <laughs> Elvira and the party monsters midway. Um, Dennis and, and Jim, Greg, um, this game uh, was marketed, marketing, and that's why I've got it as, as being significant. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you did the marketing with Elvira. Real, we're, we're running out of time, so we're going to have to make this snappy. Well, it's going to be really quick, uh, unusual for me. First licensed game uh, for anybody who sat in previously when I did a talk, talked about uh, the reaction to it, the resistance to it. But I think it set the stage uh, to try to bring Bally back from where they had been. Uh, I don't want to preempt Pat going forward, but 
it led to Adam's family and Pat making the decision to do it as a ballet game. Dennis was really disappointed because the game that we had from the Williams side was police force, and he thought with Elvira, the sales should have been better. But anyway, the first licensed game kind of opened up the doors, and more importantly, it opened up opportunities for us to reach out to the outside world and uh, offer some opportunities for pinball to gain much more attention, much more popularity, visibility, and more importantly for locations, much more accessibility. And it won best new equipment at the AMOA show yeah, right. and that more year. More importantly, I, I have to add parenthetically, the show was in Las Vegas. We were at what was uh, the old Hilton. It's now the Westgate, right near the convention center. Uh, I forget who the professional wrestler was, but we had Elvira come down. I was in a police outfit. Jim Patla was as well because we were on the other side. We had a dual dual booth. And what I wanted were armed guards to walk through the casino to get to the convention area leading Elvira there. There was a long line. We had set up a, a chair of some sort. And I went to the first guy in the line. This is a trade show. This is a business time. And I just asked. I just had to know. How long have you been standing here? He'd been standing there for two hours, not on the floor doing work, wanted to be first in line so he'd get the autograph. And that's when I knew, God damn it, Neil, you were wrong. This is really going to propel us and make us something better. <laughs> was that quick enough? It was quick enough. Thank you. Uh, Batman, we're up to, and once again, the, I put these in here because of licensing, okay? We've entered an era now in the 90s when we're pretty much clicking off every other game as being licensed, okay? Um, maybe maybe every third game, but, it, but it's growing and growing and growing. It's becoming more predominant. Funhouse, okay? This... This is there because... Not a licensed game. Huh? Not a licensed game. Not a licensed game. Just had to stick that in there. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, this, this took pinball to a place where it hadn't been. And once again, internally, when you start trying to make leaps this big, people get really nervous. Um... You know, we had people walking around saying, oh, my God, this thing is crazy. It's, you know, it's never going to do anything. Uh, but I knew when I knew when I, I had to go in on a Saturday and we had this thing where they were building prototypes. And the, the lights were barely on in this room and the games were all lit up and Rudy was sitting there. And one of the women who worked uh, in accounting walked by me. This was on a Saturday. She was in working. And she said, I hate that game. <laughs> and, and I said, why? And she said, that, and she pointed at Rudy, is hideous. <laughs> and I ran upstairs, and whoever was there on a Saturday, I said, we've got a monster hit on our hands. <laughs> Terminator 2, Steve Ritchie. Um, Terminator 2 was this huge hit, okay, licensing. Okay, Steve put together a play field that was blow you away, you know, fast and cool and and neat. And Chris Graner put together the tunes that made that game go. And, uh, and George uh, Petro and Steve and I went out to meet with uh, James Cameron and I forced them to wear suits. We got suits, and it was like, what are we talking about? We Lawyers spent here? We three hours with them. It we was did. awesome. Yep. Couldn't take any notes, but uh, wound up getting the license, and the rest is history. I wanted it so bad because it was because the first Terminator movie was just like, it was like the best B movie ever made. And it's like when we heard about T2, it had to have it. It's just uh, a great license. Danny Simon and his uh, candy red uh, Cadillac picking his up. Yep. The Adams Family. Um, Adams Family is uh, notable f in my mind for two monster reasons. The first one was the license. It 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 fulfilled 
what the player expected out of a license. Okay, it brought you the movie. Okay, it, it, it was there. Um, and this was the first game where the game play mechanic is you play modes to get to the end, okay, to get to play the cool thing at the end, okay? And guess what every freaking game out on that show floor tonight is doing, okay? Nobody since then has managed to change the game play mechanic to be something different. And if there's any game designers in the audience, I challenge you, go do it. Okay, it's been 30 years, do it. All right, before we move on, just to let everybody know, uh, Pat did not want the license originally. He thought they were gonna be a pain in the ass. It was with Orion, and I got him all sorts of material to look at. Rand Marlis was heading up the licensing, and he talked everybody into it, and lo and behold, history was made. And and by the way, Orion went or er, yeah, o Orion went bankrupt. bankrupt. No, no. Par Paramount took it over. Pa Paramount took it over. Yep. Right. So we're in the middle of this fighting with the licensor who's just gone bankrupt. And anyway, you know, history was made. And there's another great little story I'm going to tell you real fast. Ken, the reason that that game happened that way is because I went to lunch with Ken Fidesna, and he told me Roger Sharp has Adam's family available, okay? And I ran into the building, into his office and said, because this was my favorite show when I was a kid growing up, and said, I want this license, please. Yep. Okay, on we go. Jurassic Park, the game, you know, yes, it had, you know, it had a dinosaur. It ate a ball. Um, it... Uh, it once again was a licensed product. It was monster licensing on steroids because of what was going on in the movie part of the business and how it reflected on pinball. Revenge from Mars. This was the game when, remember, we were talking about how pinball tends to rise and fall, okay? Pinball was falling, and this was an attempt to try and save Williams pinball division when they were getting ready to close it down. And this was a Herculean effort by an incredibly talented group of engineers who thought they could do something different and make a difference. And it turned out that we did the right thing, but probably at the wrong time. Um, all right, we're up to 2000, 2011. Pinball recovers from almost total oblivion twice. Here we are, it's 2000, Williams has closed. The last man standing is Stern, okay? But Stern was also on shaky ground at the moment. They had bought the company from the Japanese. There was you know, money that had to be paid. And there's another, remember we told you the story about Flickr where the company would have gone away? They went to a show and if they hadn't sold a bunch of these, they were gonna close the company. Okay? It happened again. By the, by, by the, you know, the, the, the hair on your chinny chin chin, the industry was saved. And it, 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 it meant they could continue on and do what they were gonna do. And by the way, I've been told that story by the principals in the company. Simpsons Pinball Party. Um, Heath, uh, a game where you once again did licensing and this time you, you, you took an, uh, a crazy rule set from Keith, and you said, go ahead and, you know, have at it. And Keith, you wanna talk about it a little bit for a few minutes? Yeah, there was, uh, it could have been so many other games. Um, one uh, survivor had just started, and we floated the idea about doing a survivor game. And that didn't pan out because 
there was some crazy licensing guy in England who didn't want the thing to go outside of the U.S. or something. Um, and then we talked about Futurama, but Futurama, you know, it hadn't had great ratings because Fox, you know, kind of kept screwing with the schedule. And it pretty much been canceled at that point, I believe, for the first time. And we wound up on Simpsons, and we were hesitant to do Simpsons because, like, is it going to be better than the first Simpsons, which is a pretty decent seller for Data East at the time. And I was like, I could do a better game than the original Simpsons, trust me. Um, so we went out to Fox and pitched it, and uh, they loved the idea. Um, it it brought a lot of things that people weren't expecting, like an upper play field. No one had seen one of those in years. Um, and it, it brought a lot of music. Chris, you know, took over the music on that game from uh, someone else you may know named Dan Forden. Um, and Steve even helped on the game a little bit. <laughs> um, but it was a great project. Uh, you know, we used a lot of stuff we could, you know, from the actual voice people. Um, they helped out on the art a great deal. Um, and the art was led by Kevin. And, uh, yeah, it was... It was definitely it was definitely the game that uh you know kind of put me on the map as it were I guess you would say and 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 to put it that way really sells his role short um uh Keith not only is um one of the maybe five best pinball players ever um uh and a fabulous fabulous programmer and designer of rules um he's also an ask me anything guy about the Simpsons he had all the books on his shelf when when I walked in there for the first time, and I was like, "Oh, I guess we're making a Simpsons game." Huh? And he goes, "Yeah, how about it?" And um, the script that he put together incorporated lines from the show from the what fifteen twenty years of the show at that point had already yeah, I think about something yeah almost twenty years of of, of material. Um, twisted in just just the right amount to be a pinball line so when you when 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 comic book guy goes worst ball ever that's a that's just like this immortal moment you know and um and moment after moment after moment in that line in the, in that game is this just incredible it is the best pinball script in the history of pinball and i'm not even i'm literally not even exaggerating it's the best one, and the v and the VO was done so spectacularly well um, by Nancy Cartwright and Hank Azaria and Dan Castellaneta. Amazing, amazing, amazing project, just incredible. And in the big picture, once again, all of a sudden, what we're doing is we're seeing the the cool licensing that's making all of this possible. Okay, and what's going on? And something else begins to happen. My friend down here at the end of the table, okay? Up until this time, the pinball business sold almost everything they did to operators worldwide. And all of a sudden, people like Jack, who was probably the only one at the time, decided that they were going to sell games directly to the home. And just real quickly, talk about how you d decided to do that. <coughs> Back in around 1998-99, I had a customer, F.A.O. Schwarz, the famous toy store on Fifth Avenue, and they wanted to buy uh, Star Wars Episode One, which we had in that catalog. Catalogs get printed in June, but what happened in 1999 was on October, I guess it was October 25th, um, Williams closed their doors. So the buyer of F.A.O., called me up in a panic. Uh, long story short, I bought about 150 of the games from Williams and had them in advance. FAO sold all 150 games during Christmas of 1999 at $7,500 in 1999 money. A lot of celebrities, a lot of movers and shakers, people with money. Light bulb went off in my head. Gee, if I can get some pinball machines, I can sell them on eBay. I could refurbish them and sell them on eBay. So I started pinballsales.com. Anybody here ever buy a game from pinballsales.com? 
Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know, that was 1999 Christmas, but as I got into 2000, uh, Robert Fejan and Dick Sarkeesian, who owned Gottlieb and they owned Mondial Distributing, they went to Europe and they bought up all kinds of pinball machines for me, put them in containers and sent them to my building in New Jersey. We bought Adam's Families for 600 bucks, Creature from the Black Lagoon for 200 bucks, Rocky and Bullwinkles for 100 bucks. The only thing, if I wanted a lot of Adam's Families, I had to take Popeyes. <laughs> So, you know, you learn to take the good with the bad. What can I say? Um, long story short, we did that for a few years. I realized that I needed to sell the new Stern pinball machines. And um, Gary was not about, you know, if he's in the room, he knows it. And I'm not going to say anything bad because I love Gary. But um, he didn't see the vision that I saw. I saw that I could sell games to people in the home. The kids are little. They're going to grow up in 20 years, 25 years. They're going to go out and say, you know, I want to go somewhere and play a pinball machine. Guess what happened? It did happen. Um, so I became a Stern distributor. I became the biggest distributor in the world for a while. Um, you know, Steve... Worked on games. I got to go see all the Whitewoods, have my input. Pat, we got behind Monopoly. Uh, we did uh, Monopoly Platinum Edition, 40 different special games. One we donated to charity. Terminator 3, we did a big promo with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, charity game. There was no money for marketing, folks. We were uh, bushing every day. And there was really no social media like today. So, you know... Um, it was keeping it alive. It was finding a new market. Nobody came and said, well, don't buy my games. Put quarters in them on location. You know, it's it's the thing that was able to launch Jersey Jack Pinball. It was a loyal customer base that bought from pinballsales.com. And I'm real happy that we had great games. You know, The Simpsons was a great game. Lord of the Rings was a great game. There were a lot of great games. And uh, the rest, you guys know. I think you know the rest of the history. So we're we're almost out of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up here real quick. Um, what I want to do is show you in if you remember, and I know you all do, if you were alive in 2008, what happened to the economy. Um, it collapsed, and once again, pinball was smashed with everything else. Okay, um, Gary managed, Stern managed to keep his company alive um, when they literally were selling like one game a day or something. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for what it took to do that. Uh, we're up to 2011 and uh, 2012, 2013, and I'm going to show you this, and then we're going to kind of cut a little bit of this short. I'm going to talk to Bill real quick, when, and then we're going to have to quit. But the reason we're going to talk about Wizard of Oz is I had been I had been working with Gary Stern for a while, and then I, I was out of the business. I had left the business. And I came back to the show where this was being shown at Pinball Expo. And... You could watch people walk up to it, and their eyes were just dazzling, okay? Because this game took the presentation of pinball to a place it hadn't been before. And it did that be partly because of technology, but partly because of the vision of this guy. It had color-changing LEDs in it, okay? Nobody else was willing to spend the money to do that. Um, it had the video monitor in it. It took a pinball machine and said, this is the 21st century. We're going to act like it's the 21st century, and we're going to blow you away with what we can do. And between that 
and home sales, the business didn't look back. Okay, from from when it came out until we get to the pandemic, where, and there are plenty, I have slides, but I'm not gonna run them, plenty of Stern games in there that are great games, um, well done, okay. Um, we hit the pandemic and the world goes crazy. And the world goes crazy because if it was a pinball machine sitting in a warehouse, it got sold because everybody wanted a pinball machine for their basement when they couldn't get out and do anything else. Here we are now four years after the start of the pandemic. And the real question for this industry is what next? How we've watched an industry and I've laid it out for you, I think pretty succinctly, it comes within a hair's breadth of dying and it barely gets itself out of its own way and saves itself. I'm not saying that's gonna happen. I'm not predicting anything. People like to look at me and go, oh, you predicted the death of pinball. What, what I'm saying is pinball changes with the times. What's gonna do that? What's gonna make that happen? Um, we're, we're out of time and what I wanna do is I want, I wanna, I wanna real quick, I want Bill to tell you, cause we're up to the pandemic, right? We're up to the pandemic and this is why I brought him here. I don't wanna waste him. <laughs> Bill, Bill started a pinball factory in a pandemic, okay? He was there every day when everybody thought you could die if you, somebody breathed on you wrong. And just for three minutes, talk about what it was like. Uh, okay, so, well, it goes back a little bit before that. So, um, middle to late 2019, Pat comes to me and he says, can we go out to lunch sometime this week? And I'm like, Sure, it's not that unusual. We, you know, we're out to lunch, but instead of going to uh, Portillo's, he wants to go for a little drive, and he takes me to this warehouse that's the next town over from where our office was, and he says, "We're gonna move the factory from New Jersey to this building that we just leased," and I'm I'm stunned because you know it, it was so far off the radar of what I thought would ever happen, and he's like, "I really need your help because we want to keep it a secret." And so I don't want to tell a whole bunch of people. And I wonder if you could help me with this because it's more than I can do myself. And I'm like, sure, I can do whatever I can help with. What do you need help with? And he says, well, you know, they're going to close down the factory in New Jersey. And they're going to they're gonna finish building out the rest of the CE Wonka games. And they're going to ship everything to Chicago and we're gonna start building in Chicago. And I need you to figure out how to do that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a programmer, I'm a, I'm a software engineer. And I'm like, okay, it's a, you know, a little out of my wheelhouse, but uh, you know, if you need help, I, you know, we've been friends for a really long time. We, you know, we, we, you know, we did stuff in Vegas for 10 years and yeah. So I had to figure out how to build a warehouse to hold 10,000 square feet of parts for pinball machines. I had to find a way to um, set up a conveyor system to move pinball machines around. I had to figure out how to, um, um, you know, set up a 60,000 square foot warehouse and make it a factory to build pinball machines. Um, and I had some help. I mean, Pat came up with a layout for how to lay out the factory and, uh, and I had to fill in all the blanks to make it actually happen. Um, and then I get the call that, well, the trucks are on the way. And this is, this is uh, February, roughly February of um, 2020. And we're, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, I'm, I've got everything lined up. We're gonna have the racking in place to put all the stuff and we'll have, you know, some room to put all the equipment. And then we see over the horizon this COVID thing coming and it's early March and everybody's talking, you know, just quietly 
You know, there's this pandemic. There's this weird disease that nobody heard of. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And then we get to March, and again, the trucks are on the way. We know the trucks are coming, and everything shuts down like St. Patrick's Day of 2020. And nobody knows what's going to happen. We, we went in our office. We went around, and we rented a truck so we could take home games so we could keep working, you know, developing Guns N' Roses at the time. And, you know, so all, all the uh, software guys ended up with a game at their home, and a couple of the mechanical guys, I think, did too. Um, but I'm looking at this 60,000-square-foot building, and there's nobody to work in it. And, and so first thing, I had the date when the trucks were supposed to be coming, and I had to figure out how to unload the trucks. We didn't even have a forklift, so I had to rent a forklift. And then I had to learn how to drive a forklift. And I, <laughs> I, I actually, um, so Duncan's sitting over there. So Duncan and Peter and I all took the forklift class to learn how to drive a forklift. We all got certified to drive a forklift. You know, we're software guys. We didn't, you know, so... So 20 truckloads, and not like, you know, little trucks. This is the giant moving vans that are super tall with the little wheels, loaded full of every single bit of equipment from the factory in New Jersey. Um, and, and it was literally, it, a truck would show up, and it was, there was like two trucks a day for like three weeks. And the truck would show up, and it was just all hands on deck to try and get everything off that truck and find some place to put it where it wouldn't be the way of the trucks that were coming tomorrow. Um, and and um, so we got through that. And then, so then it's, um, you know, we're well into the pa pandemic. Things are shut down. And, um, you know, they're still working on building in the, in the, in the factory. They're finishing out the, the bathrooms for the factory. And they're building the, um, the, the shop areas, you know, putting in the fencing and the putting up the racking. And, um, and it's me and... Uh, uh, Fernando Hurtado, and we're laying out with masking tape on the ground where the lines are going to be for the factory. Um, and it was the two of us who put together this enormous pinball factory. Um, and then, um, you know, and then the conveyor guys came in and they put all the conveyor in the places where we laid out the masking tape, and slowly it, you know, turns into a factory. So, um, and then by June. We hired a handful of people, and we were building, we built 50 Wonka games to test out how to build pinball, and then late June, we were building Guns N' Roses, and we could not build them fast enough. Every single game that we had built went out the door to somebody go in their house, because they couldn't do anything else. They couldn't travel. They couldn't buy any cars. There were no cars available to buy, so they were buying pinball machines. And every single one of those Wonka games that they had produced before they closed down the factory, those all sold almost instantly. I'm going to thank you. I, I, I'm going to leave you with one last thought, and then we're done, and we're going to let you listen to Jack for the next hour and a half with, with, uh, with Jersey Jack Pinball. Um, pinball... We have a joke. Everybody here knows the joke. Pinball is easy. Pinball is easy. There are lots of people who the, 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 you know, bankruptcy is full of people who tried to build pinball machines. Okay? The amount of capital it takes to do this, the amount of risk it takes to do this. Imagine that you have to take a million dollars of your own money and you th throw that in front of you and that's what you spend before you get to see your first pinball machine, okay? And then you have to figure out how to order parts for the first thousand pinball machines and you, and you have to, you know, that takes a lot of guts. And so, God bless the people in the history of pinball who thought, I'm willing to take the risk. We're going to keep the game alive. And 40 years of pinball is here because of them. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>